Sure. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Courtney. Um, I'm an organizer with Resistance Ecology, also with the student group, the Student Animal Liberation Coalition. And I'm just going to get the conversation going after Bree's and Lauren have had a chance to introduce themselves with some prepared questions. I'm Lauren Nellis, and I'm the founder and director of the Food Empowerment Project. Um, we're a vegan food justice organization. We work on promoting veganism as well as advocating on behalf of farm workers who pick our food as vegans. Uh, working on access to healthy foods in communities of color and low income communities as well as trying to get people to not buy chocolate that comes from West Africa due to the worst forms of child labor including slavery taking place there. I've been involved in the animal rights movement since the late 80s when I was in high school and I've been vegan for over 25 years. My name is Amy Breeze Harper and I'm the founder of the Sister Vegan Project and the editor um, of the book Sister Vegan. Black female vegans speak on food identity, health, and society. <coughs> I started the project in 2005, and basically it focuses on the collective experiences of black female vegans in the USA, and looking at intersectionality, looking at um, the fact that we may identify as black women, but there's issues of um, gender, sexuality, class, geographical location, that affect our food philosophies, how we access food, and how we come to understand what ethical consumption is. And um, on the side of that, I also did my uh, doctoral studies looking at veganism and looking at the food commodity chain and how one derives their sense of ethics and cruelty-free and deriving this within the context of one's um, racial experience and one's geopolitical status. Um, largely looking at North America and looking at what it means to have this status as a North American privileged consumer and how you view what is cruelty free as a consumer versus would you view it the same way, the commodity the same way, if you were on the other side making the commodity possible, being exploited to make that commodity. So my doctoral work looked at that as well. I'm going to get started with some questions. Um, the first one that I have is, movement building is complex and powerful. It encompasses many different aspects, from fundraising to legal support to campaigning. Specific to the USA, a lot of us are doing this work are often confined to the limitations produced by a neoliberal, capitalist, and white supremacist framing of social and ecological justice. Even more so, many of us involved in animal liberation are unaware of how our minds have been and continue to be colonized by neoliberal whiteness. Such framing impedes holistic movement building, tokenizes inter intersectionality, and reproduces discursive violence and structural oppression within the movement. Could you speak about these challenges and offer potential solutions? <laughs> Reese can digest it easier than I can. Yeah. I was wondering, um, are people able to hear? I know we don't have a microphone, so if you're not able to hear the question or us, can you let us know? Okay, I, I'm speaking very loudly, trying to project. So um, we have a microphone up there if we need to go up and speak for people who cannot hear. Just let us know, seriously, okay? Um, so that question is incredibly broad and complex, and I can come from my own experiences with the work that I'm doing and provide a few examples that, um, I guess, exemplify that question and try to talk about some possible resolutions. So um, we're talking about this concept of intersectionality, and um, a lot of my focus has been on understanding racial politics, um, power dynamics, and how that is actually um, not uh, inseparable from social justice and liberation. But with intersectionality, I'm also, you know, I understand that it's, you know, it's gender, it's age, it's ability, it's all of these things that need to be um, engaged with when it comes to the mainstream understanding of animal liberation. So I know a lot of people here already don't go along with like the PETA way of doing things, but. Um, my answer and my experience more is how do I talk to or share my knowledge to the mainstream animal liberation person who has derived their information about animal compassion and liberation through organizations such as PETA, uh, who I feel they're very um, superficial when it comes to understanding 
the roots of oppression and really stepping up and challenging structural forms of oppression. Um, so one of the examples I want to talk about is with the Sista Vegan Project, um, the example of this lack of collaboration or solidarity with people or groups that do not necessarily align their politics or their even rationale for their social justice work around the same rationale as the mainstream. So for instance, uh, my work looks at African American women, why they've become vegan, and really looking at that as much as mainstream society, America, wants to say that we're in a post-racial era and that race no longer matters, race no longer um, impacts one's life's chances for health and access to good job opportunities, etc. that that is not true. And that my work looks at that and the women in this project and allies, we discuss this. Um, and these are intersectional issues that you cannot deny because in America, collectively, there is a problem with racism and white supremacy. And you can see it manifest when you look at groups that have access to food, health resources that they need for their communities to thrive, and it's usually low-income communities of color that have the least amount of resources that they need. And that is in part due to a history of how resources have been allocated, have been made accessible to the ruling racial socioeconomic elite, being white, middle-class, upper-class peoples. So um, with my work, I started in 2005 really looking at what does it mean to be a black woman in this country and then want to engage in plant-based dietary philosophies consumption, whether it's for animal rights or it's for combating health disparities. And one of the challenges I actually had was um, coming from a mainstream group of vegan and animal rights activists who would comment on the initial call for papers for my project to search for these black female voices. And they did not understand why I was engaging in this intersectionality and looking at race and gender. And a lot of the comments I got were that it's racist to look at race. Or you're just like you were saying in the other talk, it's, you're distracting. It's only about the animals. So there was a sense of this mainstream group of people who really loved to talk about how, um, you know, we need to engage in animal compassion and liberation because um, you know, we're going to use these examples, look at how it was for black slavery or the Jewish Holocaust, and kind of using these superficial <clears throat> notions of racism from the past, but lacking a critical literacy for a post-2000 era to understand how racism manifests now. So it's not necessarily racism is enslaving black people in antebellum America. Racism is the Jewish Holocaust that took place in Nazi Germany. So there was this lack of understanding when I proposed my project that, yeah, black women are collectively going to look at veganism differently, and this is why. So what I saw was a lack of support and just this animosity from a lot of um, white-identified vegans who simply did not or could not get it. And many of them would admit that they wouldn't, they never picked up any information about black feminist theory or critical race studies, but they knew already they were the experts, and they could immediately dismiss, you know, tens of thousands of women's lived experiences of being black in this country, and that, you know, a lot of us want to look at veganism not necessarily for animal rights first. A lot of us are dealing with issues such as health disparities that are caused by legacies of colonialism, slavery, and Jim Crow. So how can we actually make those issues a part of this thing called veganism or the vegan movement in America? So I felt like that was one of the challenges that I had to deal with. How is it, you know, it's externally, when you've got people fighting against you, I, I, I get that. When I want to talk about racism, I know, you know, neo-Nazis are probably not going to like that. I'm in this country talking about that. Um, I, I expect that, but I don't expect a lack of understanding or critical awareness around the importances of intersectionality within the movement. So in 2005 or six, that was incredibly difficult for me to handle, um, but uh, I think one of the challenges is when you have somebody, whether they're racially privileged or economically privileged, 
to get to the point to actually see your privileges and to actually see how, whether you are consciously a racist or not, the way power is configured in this country, you're going to benefit from particular identities that you have that are part of the status quo. So if I'm in a heterosexual marriage. I'm not consciously homophobic or heterosexist, but I know, I acknowledge that I benefit from being in a heterosexual marriage. And I hope I can be mindful when someone talks to me about the issues that they're dealing with as a person who is not straight. So um, this is kind of what I need to see in the movement uh, in terms of intersectionality is for a privileged group of people, whether you're racially privileged or economically privileged, to actually step back and consider that there are other realities, that there are other stories that are just as important and can actually support and bolster the movement and really come together and understand this complete holistic, um, holistic uh, goal that should encompass animal liberation, intersectionality, and social justice. So that's one of the examples I can give. And um, over the past seven years, it's gotten a little bit better, but I still receive um, people, regardless of getting a PhD in this, you know, like having that, I know what I'm talking about, I can back it up, still getting a lot of that hostility from largely white middle class vegans who just don't want to engage with um, anything outside of the single issue of just animal rights. Let's, let's leave the race, the class issue somewhere else. So my experience, I'm going to kind of go off to what Bree said since it's easier for me to understand what to say based versus that question exactly. Um, but basically, I mean, Food Empowerment Project was started as a response from my vegan advocacy. Um, and running a nonprofit that investigated factory farms and ran corporate campaigns. And the backlash I received when I tried to talk about human rights issues related to veganism, not disconnected, but related to it, the food that we eat grown by farm workers and the chocolate that we eat that isn't necessarily cruelty-free just because it's vegan. So I received a lot of backlash and realized that the only way, you know, I understand missions of organizations, right? I understand I'm not asking or do I believe that animal rights organizations need to lead their mission and all of a sudden do human rights work? I'm not asking for that when I talk about the way to connect these issues. But the problem is, is you have them completely ignoring anything else other than what they're saying. So, our, so when they talk about chocolate being cruelty-free, there's no comprehension that you can't call it cruelty-free if it's on the backs of children in West Africa. You can't say that our diet is the most compassionate diet and the most cruelty-free diet out there if you have farm workers in California dying of heat stroke, if you have them living near the rivers, living in labor camps because of the fact that people don't want to pay them a living wage. That we have issues that we need to acknowledge, that we can't say veganism is easy, everybody can be vegan, without acknowledging that communities of color and low-income communities have difficulty even accessing produce, much less veggie burgers, and dairy alternatives. And my concern in starting it also was the fact that we tokenize a lot of these other issues for our own gain. And I find it absolutely offensive, and I feel very strongly it's something that I hope everybody in this room will take a stand against. In California, there are regularly marches um, for Cesar Chavez's birthday, which is in late April. Many of you probably know that Cesar Chavez was a vegan. And he was a vegan because of the suffering of animals, as are many of the leadership of the United Farm Workers and FLOC, another um, labor organizing group. The leadership tends to be um, vegan or strict vegetarians. Instead of vegans looking at this as an opportunity to speak out and advocate on behalf of what Cesar Chavez devoted his life to, which is the rights of farm workers and the plight of farm workers, what they do instead is go out and leaflet on veganism. And I have been to these marches from L.A. to Northern California. And the majority of people who are marching in these uh, marches are farm workers. Farm workers who, again, don't really have access to the food that they're picking themselves. So, again, there's this lack of understanding, this lack of ability to say, you know what, this is the day we're going to go out and we're going to march and we're going to talk about the plight of farm workers who pick our food. The tokenism when recently a study came out about um, workers in the chicken processing industry who were um, really dying because of the chemicals that are used. You saw vegan tweets and all this about, well, if you care about workers, go vegan. Like again, no consciousness that workers in our own food system are subject to the exact same problems 
than slaughterhouse workers, minus the fact that they're not killing animals. So we use this slogan all the time, human rights, animal rights. And then the ability to live up to it, it proves to us, more than not, that it's a slogan. And we tokenize every, almost every other movement for our own gain. And so when we talk about these issues, there's a way for us to bring it together. And again, not saying that animal rights groups need to desert their own missions. Absolutely not. But I would ask that when they know there's a campaign going against Cliff Bar, who is a predominantly vegan company, um, for not disclosing where their chocolate comes from, that they not hand out Cliff Bars and Luna Bars at events. That they not have Coca-Cola products that they not have products that are also infused with other forms of human rights abuses. I'm going to pause the talk for a second so that we can fix the buzzing. <laughs> Hopefully it will be fixed now. Yeah. <laughs> are not thought of as real activists who are capable of building a movement in a way that grassroots activists and nonprofit organizations such as PETA and Friends of Animals. Can you talk about how you academic scholars are helping to build a movement beyond a single issue? How academic research and writing go beyond intellectual masturbation and can be applicable to the average animal liberation activist? I couldn't think of a better way to frame intellectual masturbation. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I apologize. It's true, though. <laughs> yeah. um, so the question is, um, it should be for both of you and I. I know I, I had said you academic scholars. But, but I'm not an academic but, scholar. Um, but I will follow up, okay. <laughs> um, So I actually asked that question because I've actually received throughout the last six or seven years from quite a few people who are not ac academics and ask me, well, what's the point of you getting a PhD? What is the point of you writing about this stuff? Um, how do you actually see what you're doing as a significant change maker in the real world? Um, so I have to be honest and say that I just, for some reason, I've always just loved academia um, as my space to affect change. And I know a lot of the people who have affected me deeply and shifted my consciousness have been academics, um, largely the, from the canon of black feminist theory and critical race studies. Um, and I feel like, in part, that to build a movement, you need all different types of, of resources and different ways of knowing, knowing and knowledge systems. And with my experience, I feel like doing social science research, um, learning like the particular methods and methodologies that are so coveted in academia, uh, it gives me a type of leverage when I do want to start asking for resources. And I had talked about this earlier in my other uh, talk that um, I realized I have to kind of learn the language of the status quo personally if I need to get the resources that I need. And unfortunately, part of that is um, 
a lot of these people who want to give money want to see a particular research style. You know, how do you come to the conclusion that animal abuse is bad? You know, I just can't come with an opinion. A lot of these organizations want to see, you know, what, what methods did you use and what type of research model. So I feel like that helps when I want to start seeking grants and start using that language and using that particular uh, method of communication. And I also feel like um, a lot of the work that I do, people who are not in the academy, I get a lot of younger activists who write me feeling like they're alone or that they don't really think that what they're doing is on the right path because they just can't find a local community that supports what they're doing. So a lot of times I'll just send them a, a list of citations and academic peer-reviewed work that really um, supports their own grounded experiences. And a lot of people come back to me and tell me that's been really helpful, and it's been helpful for them to take that, those literature, that literature um, to their family, um, or take it to their academic departments, or take it, sorry, not the academic departments, so take it to their nonprofits and show them um, that you know, there's actually social science research behind um, how I feel. So um, I think that's in part helpful. I know uh, several people told me that they really experienced um, trauma from just living as a person of color and dealing with racism, but they, they weren't really sure how to express it in their community or to their place of work. And it was helpful for me to give them access to, you know, there's actually journals written about this and there's actual peer-reviewed books that, that, um, that uh, support, you know, how you feel. So I'm hoping that's a fairly adequate answer, but it feels like also that I have to deal with, um, you know, what it means where I have to kind of play this game in the language of the colonizer. Um, so I do, I have still dealing with that emotionally where I have to, like, I can't just speak the way I did when I was 15 and just say it like it is and be the angry black woman. I have to, I have to kind of uh, learn this new way of talking and this new way of research and methods so I can hopefully get access to the resources I need a little better. But we'll see if that works out in a few years. I've often needed to have help translation with Bree sometimes when she was writing her dissertation and because um, it's hard for me to understand. I'm not an academic scholar, but I do. Food Empowerment Project is an organization that relies heavily on people in the academics um, with our work on access to healthy foods in communities of color. We need a lot of help with that in terms of researchers. But also an area that's been very helpful in, in kind of exposing a little bit um, why we need this work is in our work on the chocolate issue, where a lot of NGOs are wed to fair trade, they're wed to rainforest certified, they're wed to many of these cert third party certification systems that I, in ISO 8001, if you know about that, that was related to the garment workers um, in Pakistan not too long ago, that there's a lot of these third party certifications that corporations can get to say that they're worker friendly. And um, they've been, we've there's problems with them, but unfortunately NGOs become sometimes too tied into one, endorsing these third party certifications, and two, the corporations who use them. Because a lot of times, but not always, but a lot of times these third party certifications are being funded by the companies. And the only information that we've really gotten to have a more critical look at safe to fair trade uh, or rainforest certified is coming from the academic community. Um, Bree's, uh, we, we, we've had some issues um, internally with Food Empowerment Project, like how do we handle the fact that a lot of these organizations will not come out and say anything negative about fair trade, even though we know there are inherent problems with it. And she was, you know, I'm discussing this with her, and she's like, oh, there's a paper on it, I'll send it to you. So although I'm not a, an academic scholar and I can't talk in very big words, um, uh, I, I understand the usefulness of it, that again, like Bree said, I mean, we need all of it, you know, just like we need every tool in the toolbox, we need every, um, every career that's out there. I know in starting out and doing grassroots groups, uh, my favorite um, job that anybody had was the person who worked at Kinko's, and I know that's a really long time ago for y'all, but everything we did was paper, you know, every flyer, every press release, and so anybody who worked at Kinko's meant free flyers and free supplies. So anyway, anybody of any career can be helpful.
So the third question that I have is, what do you think is the hurdle for getting animal liberationists to actively and financially support the intersection of issues? Um, can you tell the difference in the questions? No, I'm just um, I think that's something that there's probably many answers for, quite honestly. I know that some, in doing the chocolate issue like we have, um, we've experienced many vegans who feel like, I'm already doing enough. You know, don't talk to me about any more. Kind of like how people, environmentalists maybe, um, how they feel that environmentalists handle when they're trying to, when they're being talked to about going vegan. You know, I already do enough. I don't want to hear it. You know, it's, it's amazing the exact same responses that we get about the chocolate issue, about farm worker issues, about any of these other issues is the exact same Exact same, and it's funny, we talk about the palm oil issue, anything. If you don't, no, we don't want to hear about it, I can't look at that. You know, I'm already doing enough, so that's part of it. Um, I think as well as that, um, a lot of the stuff we're talking about as well is looking in, at yourself a little bit. Whereas, you know, most of what happens to animals, we're kind of like talking about something externally um, that's happening to animals, but when we're talking about the, our own way that we see things, uh, I think it's hard for um, people to get on board with that. I think it's hard for us to, to raise funds um, because, uh, at least for our Food Empowerment Project, although we are a vegan organization, other than this conference, many groups um, and organizers don't see us as an animal group. They don't see us as a vegan group because we talk about other social justice issues. Um, we don't have cute, fuzzy animals to show either. We have people who are... Uh, who are victims of some of the same corporations um, that are abusing animals. So I think that in some ways, I, mean, I could probably think more about this, about all the different reasons, but I think there's, you know, it, it's, it's a shame too, and, and we'll go on to this later, but the fact is, is that we as a movement would grow if we started to invest in these concepts of connecting these issues um, versus remaining stagnant, stagnant and being single issue. So, oh, um, my answer, like I don't, and there's many answers to it, but I can give my best from my own experience. Um, I feel like, you know, the looking in, at oneself is one of the most, probably significant, the probably most significant challenges I have. So, um, when I'm talking to others to kind of, you know, look at what does it mean if I were to engage in true solidarity, and I think there might also, there might be a fear of what might be lost, and within the context of America, I feel like a lot of people are addicted to consumerism or consumption as a way to um, build their identity, but also like pleasure and desire. And I had said earlier, it feels like a lot of people can give up their species privilege, but not necessarily their consumerist privilege, and it seems like it's just an easier thing to deal with. Um, and I also feel like a lot of people uh, may not just, I don't know, it feels like if I want to go out and ask for a particular types of funding, you know, you had talked about fluffy animals. And um, I live in Berkeley and during the summer a lot of the young college students, they take I guess internships with Greenpeace and I always see how, you know, do you want to save the polar bears? And that's their sense of how to get people connected to um, environmental, environmentalism, environmental injustices. And I've always thought that's really interesting because I'm focused more on environmental racism and I wonder how well their campaign would sell if they actually showed like communities in Oakland that are suffering, you know. Um, what about cute fuzzy animals garners more money? You know, what about, what does that say uh, versus we're actually showing someone who is being affected by environmental racism or just like a human being who's being affected. Um, why can't the mainstream have the same types of compassion or um, like a sentimental response to the polar bears as um, to, you know, using actual loved experiences and visuals of the issues that are happening right next door to me in Oakland. So, um, you know, I don't know, I've begun to actually question if I should start catering to that mainstream language and what works. 
Um, I'm trying to turn Sister Vegan into a nonprofit, and I posted language that is new for my group. We're really focusing more on, you know, I have to talk more about animal compassion, animal compassion, kind of make it more central because maybe people aren't going to fund me because I'm only talking about structural racism. Like, I've actually started thinking about that and kind of feeling bad about that. You know, like, am I giving in and what am I, what am I giving up and, and, you know, and then I also started thinking maybe I shouldn't give up and maybe I should focus more on maybe the people within my community, maybe there's enough of us, there's seven billion people on the planet, I think, what, 1% have access to internet, I can't remember, it's very small, but um, maybe, I don't know, maybe I'm, my, probably my figures are wrong, but there's gotta be enough people that I can reach out to and maybe we can get those resources without compromising, I just don't know. We haven't had much luck with that. <laughs> we do not compromise, um, and that's probably where we're at, but one, one of the things when you talk about the polar bears is that is how the environmental justice groups kind of define themselves differently than the mainstream environmental groups. Is that the mainstream environmental groups are talking about climate change, really global warming, um, and they're showing the polar bear. Whereas the communities, Katrina, you know, that was because of global warming, what happened. And so the environmental justice community is saying, this is our version, you know, these are the people who are being impacted and how it's different, you know, and how we're trying, because I work for an environmental justice group, you know, how we're trying to get um, the environmental, mainstream environmental groups to really be talking about some of this. And, and, you know, talking about intersectionality, I mean, some of them are starting to get it. You had the Sierra Club recently who had a very interesting policy on immigration to change that because they're getting it. You have the, the, all the immigrants group, all the um, work that's being done right now talking about... Um, gay and lesbian couples as well when it comes to deportation. You know, this connection that's being made by the human rights groups together. You know, and just it's not single issued. It's not just, you know, just predominantly um, immigrants coming or from Mexico or from South America. But it's everywhere. You know, and so there's a connection being made. And I think that that's what the beauty of this conference is, is trying to say, we need to do that. And again, not tokenize these issues, but really, um, work on them, and learn about them. I have one more prepared question, um, and that is, have there been times in history where intersectionality has helped causes outside of the animal liberation movement? I just started this, didn't I? But now history, so that's current. <laughs> it's like I knew what question was coming next. Okay. Um, so, yes, and that's the brilliant thing, is that if you look at, and I'm just going to give y'all just, um, you can tell my text is messed, y'all, um, just quick people in history who did do this, um, starting with William Wilberforce, who was an um, abolitionist in England, who also started the RSPCA. You have um, Frederick Douglass, who was an abolitionist, who was the outspoken person who helped the women's um, convention that took place in Seneca Falls, that got them, that helped them. Um, I believe it was Elizabeth Cady Stanton who got up and started talking about the women's right to vote, and it was him who got up and started speaking in favor of women's right to vote. You have um, Martin Luther King Jr., of course, who's my example because, you know, who worked obviously on the civil rights movement, but he also brought into the discussion uh, later, Vietnam, he started speaking out against the war. He started to um, speak about poverty, started speaking about the janitor's plight in Chicago. This is when he got assassinated. This is when he became dangerous. This is when they didn't like it. To the Black Panther Party, who was talking about, you know, everything about during the civil rights era as well, all the rights, everything that was going on there, but they also talked about food issues. You know, it wasn't just about, you know, everybody associated. I, in the little publication that they put out, um, there's a, a little blog that I wrote about um, the work that we're going to be doing with the Huey P. Newton Foundation. But um, that they, they bridge these issues as well. You know, and the thing is, is that that's, that is what creates power. That is what creates a movement, not symbolic protests. What creates a movement is building these bridges and not just giving lip service to them, but living to them. In California, 
we had, um, which I'm sure, at least I hope everybody's heard about, this horrible initiative that passed called Proposition 8 that basically plagues California um, that uh, it's very sickly marriage inequality, which was passed in California. And I went to a rally after um, the vote took place. And during this same time, there was an initiative in California called Proposition 2 that passed overwhelmingly um, to allow pregnant pigs the ability to stretch their limbs, uh, male calves the ability to stretch their limbs, turn around, and hens to be able to. So basically, none of these critters would be in confinement. Um, pregnant pigs, baby male calves, and, and hens raised for eggs. So at this protest, there was a lot of backlash to animal people because of the fact that this marriage inequality initiative passed at the same time as this pro-animal initiative passed. So there was a protest in San Jose where I was living at the time, and there were, people were holding signs that people cared more about the hens than they did about these other issues. So I approached the people who were holding these signs, and I said, don't let them do this to us. We are natural allies. We need to be on the same side. And had a fantastic dialogue with them where they got it. You know, and that's it. It's just starting this dialogue where we can have it. But we, we can't have this dialogue if all we're telling people is, if you care about workers, go vegan. They can see through that. You know, we need to inform ourselves about our own ways that food is being produced. And so we can have enriching conversations with people of their social justice movements. And, um I'm sorry, I'm not being rude looking at the clock. My plane leaves at 7.30, so I want to make sure that I leave enough time for um, questions. I can't actually see there's a glare. 13 minutes. Okay. So um, I think instead of answering, because I think you did a wonderful job, I wanted to actually know if we can uh, kind of open it up to Q&A. How do you feel about that? Sounds good to me. Okay, so if people have there questions, one question. comments. I, yeah, I'm just hearing you guys talking and feeling like that, have you guys personally encountered a lot of resistance to, like, integration between the movements? Because I feel like it's almost just common sense, like, if you want to live a life of, like, integrity and compassion to care about all of these issues, and it just confuses me that, that I haven't really encountered too many people who are trying to, like, oppose them. It's just, like, a really new, I would, I'm just, like, trying to understand, like, why they would not make a connection between like oppression here and oppression there and oppression of the planet, oppression of people, oppression of species, like it's pretty related, like do you encounter a lot of that and like why, would, what is their justification for that because I don't really understand. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean I had brought up at the beginning how there was uh, negative responses to just the concept of sister vegan and looking at black female vegans. I don't really, I don't know why, you know, those individuals, not in their brain to really know why there is this resistance to acknowledge that race does matter. I, I, I really don't know. Um, you know. I've read theories around critical whiteness studies that talk about um, what it means to be racialized and socialized into whiteness in America and that you know, part of that is at least in a post-civil rights era is to convince this demographic that race really doesn't matter. And you're not going to be able to see how race matters if you're always the beneficiary of white privilege and you live in spaces <coughs> where, for instance, you know, the cops, you know, they, we have a great relationship with the police. We have, the, we, I have no concept of racial profiling. Why would I need to have that concept? Like, living in these spaces where predominantly most whites in America live in predominantly white spaces. So I think um, for the most part, with my experience with that defensiveness, is that most white folk that... I've encountered or I've spoken to, they've only lived in spaces of whiteness, and they've lived in these spaces um, where they really think racism isn't a problem, because why would you know that if A, you are white, and you're living in those spaces and never really see it externally, and or you never receive it because you know, you're right, or um, if it does happen, you just don't have um, the literacy to understand that that actually is racism. So I think it's, that's the broad statement. Um, Alternatively, it could also be that a lot of the folk really do know it's a problem. And I know when I had to come to terms with certain things that I had privileges around, the immediate response for so many people I talk to is defensiveness. You know, like seriously, it's not cool if you thought you were a nice, kind human being all these years and then you realize from an alternative community 
that your actions or oblivion or ignorance have actually been causing pain and suffering. And that's hard. A lot of people don't really want to talk about that, but you know, I remember I had a lot of resistance against things that my husband would tell me when he first met me. He's not from here, but he would notice the way I would handle things, and it reflected a lot of the privileges that I had. I mean, I, I'm a recipient of you know, racism and sexism, but I also have these other privileges. One of them was my first world consumer privilege, where everything is disposable. You know, like eight years ago, this is before I became aware of these things. Um, and my defensiveness, you know, like, who the hell is he to tell me that? This is how I enact my freedom. Like, black people don't have anything for 400 years, and now I can you know, enact it. Like, you know, just all of these emotions. Like, what are you talking about that? Are you implying that I'm not a good person? I mean, I'm a black feminist theorist. You know, like, all of these things. So I think, in part, a lot of it is it's hurtful um, to actually realize, oh, my God, like, and this other person from another community is actually telling me that I may actually be causing or perpetuating suffering. So I think it's, it's kind of... To maybe both of those I, I talked about, maybe one of them, I think that's what could be going on, but I'm not, you know, I'm not in that person's mind. That's, that's the sense I get, and that it's like transformation is really kind of difficult for many levels, whether you're invested in the privilege of consumer or the privilege <coughs> that those identities give to you, or you really just, it's too much, like it's actually kind of traumatic to realize, oh my God, I've actually been perpetuating something. In my two cents. I mentioned before when I was running the vegan organization and I would talk about the plight of farm workers in the chocolate industry, I would be told straight out by people who ran vegan and animal groups, you're hurting the animals, you're hurting veganism. And um, so I realized I couldn't, you know, my group's mission was, you know, farmed animals. So that is what gave me the help to make my decision to start Food Empowerment Project so I could talk about these issues and talk about veganism, and not feel like it was one or the other, but it's all the same. And, um, you know, I, why this is, I don't know, you know, but I think that there's hope, and the fact is that there's hope with people like you, and people like in this room, who get it. You know, and if you, hopefully if you didn't get it beforehand, you're getting it now, um, but that is truly the hope, and that's, I, you know, when I mentioned earlier, I mean, the strongest supporters of Food Empowerment Project are all people who don't have money, because we advocate for people who don't have money, and students, and academics, who also don't have money. You know, so I mean, there's the hope out there that we have the young people who are going to live a lot longer than me, and the academics who are going to be dispelling this information out there. So unfortunately, it does exist, but the problem is, is that um, you're the future, but you can make it your right now by working on these issues right now and making sure that you speak out when you hear, and you will hear. I mean, some of the proof in the backlash we've received is by vegan companies, vegan companies who make chocolate, who ignore us. We're a vegan organization, and if you look at our companies who did not respond to us, it's not Newman's Own, who isn't a vegan company. They responded to us in less than 45 minutes. It's companies like Alternative Baking Company who still have ne never responded to us, who are an all-vegan company to the fact that no animal group will support our campaign against Cliff Bar, even though they primarily make vegan products. Well, there's something else. Like, there's so many different bars to choose from. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Cliff Bar, did you hear that? <laughs> I think Breeze has just a few more minutes. Um, well, my taxi comes at 6, but I'm sure we can wait a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, uh, in the back. Yeah. I'm kind of uh, noticing with all sorts of different movements, um, kind of what you're talking about, there's this tunnel vision where you want to focus on your cliquish needs, like we don't agree with this, we don't agree with that, so we're this chapter, and you're that chapter, which I think transcends like even racial boundaries. Because with the race, I understand, like uh, in theory, some things apply, whereas in practice they don't, so it's easy for uh, people, especially in the vegan community, to kind of look past the racism as that being like separatist, and if we're not speciesist, why would we want to focus on racism? But I'm wondering if you notice, like, in all of these different issues, um, that the movement is actually broken down by some internal, like, divide and conquer with all these different issues, because, like, the main object, I think, if you're trying to achieve a means, is to rally all of the people that it affects. And if you start arguing simply based on veganism, you're going to turn a lot of people off to that. There's going to be a lot of people that don't care. If you argue only about animal rights, there's going to be other people that don't care. But if you argue
argue about like human rights. You know, we're we're trying to get people on our side. The animals are doing their thing, and we're fighting for them. But we need people to like back all of these different issues. And I think what happens, even being here with some of the enlightened people that are here, like I'm noticing, um, like people are saying, you know, that organization isn't good, you know, or that organization isn't like truly uh, standing up for animal rights. And it seems like that's kind of like breaking down like the infrastructure of what could be a large movement into smaller movements that are in opposition to each other. Well, I'd be, um, you could accuse me of that, you know? Um, but as a person of color, and probably, I don't know, let me know if there's any other vegan animal rights groups run by a person of color, I didn't feel like what currently existed represented what I felt needed to be represented. And that's why I had to start another organization. Um, and we do have to be careful who we work with. Because we, it, you know, I, I can't even tell you. And that's, but that's not just animal issues. That's every issue. We have to be so careful with who we work with because we hold strong. I mean, we don't have a lot of money, but we have our credibility. And so, I mean, I get what you're saying that, you, you know, there's this ideal world about everybody working together and us being unified. But at the same time, I wrote a whole blog against this, too. If someone's homophobic, someone's racist, I don't want them in Food Empowerment Project. I really don't. I don't feel like I need it, you know? Oh, well, if they have a lot of money, I still don't need it. Um, you know, it's just that we need to have some standards here. We need to have some things. And, you know, we have the mission of what we're about. And other working, because I've been asked before, you know, when I talk about this stuff, how does that make Republicans feel? You know, and it's like, I don't care how it makes Republicans feel. I really don't. I don't have time for that. There's enough work that needs to be done, and I get it, and I appreciate this desire of unity, but you know what? I'm, I, I want to be unified with the people who at least are on the same um, moral ethic that I am. That, I, God, that sounded really arrogant, but I didn't mean it that way. I just meant, like, the Food Empowerment Project mission, like, you don't all have to believe in everything I believe in, but we can talk about that later. Um, to try to answer your question in about two minutes, um, I think what I've been trying to do is when I see, like, for me, it's not like I think any organization is perfect. I think if organizations can be open to constructive criticism on how to become, I guess, or manifest, you know, the, I mean, try to build solidarity. So like PETA, I mean, I, I, I do critique them, you know, uh, but I mean, I also, in my dissertation, I also say that they've done a lot of good things, you know, and for me, I mean, I have a different perspective than Lauren, but I have contacted many of the organizations actually saying, you know, I would love to um, help you be more inclusive and help you figure out, you know, why you may be offensive to particular demographics. And I don't hear anything. Like, you know, 10 months later, no job offers, no, I'm a little bitter, but, you know, no one's really interested. So I'm like, I'm trying to do that. You know, I'm not like, I tell my students, you know, just because you read, a, don't read a book. Well, we're so conditioned, at least in America, is that you immediately critique every book that you read, at least in my schooling, everyone was like, as soon as you read a book, let's actually be negative about it. Let's critique it. You know, like, oh, this book was horrible, blah, blah, blah. And I asked my students when I was teaching, actually, um, let's look at what was beneficial about the book and you know, how can we build on the knowledge of this already and then expand upon it, what's missing. And I kind of feel like I want to do that with a lot of these organizations in which I see um, what, they're, what they're, they're, they're missing. You know, and, you know, like, Pina, you may have issues, but I would love to, to just offer, here's my dissertation, you know, this is what I wrote about in this chapter about you guys, and I think if you're more aware of, of how you shape your sense of ethics and how it is actually, um, it does not include everyone, I think if you really got that, I think that could help your organization. You know, so I, I do know what you're talking about, but I'm trying to figure out, you know, is there a way where, um, instead of immediately thinking, oh, that's the wrong type of animal liberation group, and you know, they have nothing to offer, is there a way where I can we can kind of learn from each other but in a way that doesn't compromise our, I guess, our sanity when it comes to, you know, yeah, you know what I mean. But anyway, that's my quick answer. And the cab company just called me. Yes. So, yeah. um, I think they're waiting for me. So I have to catch up.
want everybody to take the opportunity right now to stand up and stretch.